Welcome to the Maranatha Bible Class with Bible teacher Bob Soriano. friends great to have you with us again today today we're going to pick up with uh, our teaching from first Peter and we're in chapter 4 today and we're going to read and we're going to uh, teach on the whole chapter today uh, there won't be a part 1 and a part 2 and we'll do the same thing for chapter 5 because these are short shorter chapters so if you have your Bible with you if you will follow along with me I'll be reading from the New King James Version today. And chapter 4 deals with a couple of things, but it really touches on uh, Christian suffering, going through some difficult times, but using Christ as our our example, that he suffered for us to pay the penalty for our sins, and that we need to be strong soldiers, even though we're going through some things there's not any in other words we are not the only ones going through these these difficult situations whether it's persecution physical issues uh, whatever it may be there's other christians throughout the world that are going through the same thing so we can have confidence that we're just not singled out uh, with these particular issues but we have a relationship with christ and that we can be strengthened by him uh, as we come to him for strength and guidance during difficult times. So I'm going to start with uh, chapter 4, verse 1. This is what scripture tells us. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with that same mind For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I want to stop there. Now, what the scripture is not telling us is that uh, once we come to Christ, that we will never sin again. Uh, That is utopia. That is uh, perfection. That is what we need to be uh, trying to do. That should be our goal. Uh, but in reality, that's that's not going to be uh, very practical because we are still in the flesh. We are still going to commit sin. But the beautiful thing is that we have a relationship with the Lord that when we commit a sin, uh, we have a relationship with the Lord. All we have to do is just ask the Lord to forgive us. If we come humbly before him and we are truly sorry for what we did, and it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, it could be a bad thought. It could be uh, saying something abruptly to your spouse, to your children, to a friend, a coworker, whatever it may be. We have a relationship with the Lord that we can say, Lord, you know, I, I shouldn't have said what I said the way I said it to that person. Please forgive me. And the Lord will immediately forgive you. Uh, and I also believe that we have the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. I believe that most of the time, if we're really in a good relationship with the Lord, that before we even commit the sin, we're already being convicted because the Holy Spirit is giving us a nudge in the side that, hey, what, what, where you're about to go, don't do it. But if we do it, we can ask for forgiveness and go on. And, and the scripture here, when it says ceased from sin, 
it really it's really saying that uh, you as an individual will no longer practice sin live in habitual sin where you're constantly sinning otherwise you really have no relationship with the Lord now if we stumble into it that's one thing but if we continue to practice sin and if we know it's sin then then that's a that's a completely different issue all right verse 2 that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh this is very important for the lusts of men but for the will of God so here it's telling us that once we come to Christ we need to not be living after those desires that we had before we came to Christ now we're a new person in Christ we have been resurrected from the old man we're living a new life and we are trying every day to do our very best to please the Lord in how we live our life now we are not saved by works but we should have good godly works uh, reflective in our life as we walk in a relationship with Christ and we should not be walking after fleshly things that we uh, that enticed us before we should leave those things behind and that's what the, these scriptures are going to be talking about and this is very important and we should be pursuing the will of God what is God's will for our lives you know my friends we all have a call once we come to Christ we all have a call to do something to work for the Lord my calling is teaching the Word of God and and I'm going to be held to a much higher accountability than even perhaps an evangelist or even some pastors because I am teaching doctrine teaching the Word of God and I I'm called to do this to edify the body of Christ to uh, to help new Christians new converts and older Christians uh, and I and I've been called to teach on everything from Genesis all the way to Revelation creationism uh, the history of the Old Testament uh, Bible prophecy Bible apologetics uh, hermeneutics all of these things um, all the doctrines the fundamental doctrines of the faith to equip Christians so that when they run into whether it's uh, someone in a cult or a lost person or an atheist or somebody that's uh, a mocker or a scoffer that when they're asked questions that they can rightfully uh, give the correct answers to these people prayed up seasons with salt that uh, hopefully that we can win some of those people to Christ and over the years God has given me the privilege and the honor to be able to witness to a lot of people in the cults Jehovah Witnesses Mormons uh, all kinds of other New Age cults and uh, the Lord has blessed me to be able to uh, be you to use me uh, this is not a prideful thing here but the Lord has used me uh, to plant seed and bring people out of the cults into a true relationship with Christ. And whoa, oh, what a glorious thing it is to see someone that is uh, held in bondage and in darkness, and when they see the light, that they can come to come to Christ. What a beautiful thing! So uh, that is my calling. But my question to you is, what is your calling? What has God called you to do? Do you know what that is? If you don't, uh, I would really sincerely be praying about that, that God would show you what he's calling you to do. And I, I have been to uh, churches over the years, and there's some good, godly brothers and sisters that are called into ministry to help pastors. Uh, to help the church they have what I believe is the gift of helps where they do things without wanting to be seen without any recognition they're always there they're always supporting a local congregation and they're doing things a lot of times what a lot of other people don't want to do uh, and 
uh, all I can say is God bless those people. They are such a blessing. You know, I, I remember uh, years ago going to this one church, and there was a lady. She was out in the parking lot every Sunday. She, wear, she would wear a vest, and her job, uh, her ministry, was as you drove into the, uh, the, the parking area, or I should say the property of the church, all she did was wave at everybody, smiled and waved. And it immediately blessed you because you're, you're showing up to church. And if, if you were a first-time visitor there, this blessed you. And I, I, can I say maybe it even lowered your hedge that you were going to put up as, as far as a defense going into a new church? And she immediately felt made you feel welcome loved and appreciated and she had a gift and I, I remember when she was not there for two weeks the, the pastor and this was a church that had thousands of people in it the pastor had to address it from the pulpit and, and make sure everybody understood she was okay uh, I think either she was on vacation or she had surgery or I can't remember what it was but the, he must have been bombarded with people asking where is she because nobody could really replace the wonderful job that she did greeting you as you drove into the parking lot. So my friends, I would ask you, what is your gift? Uh, what is it that you're supposed to do? And maybe you are to be an encourager. You know, uh, a lot of people have a great gift of encouraging others. And I can tell you that pastors seldom get encouraged like they should. Uh, they deal with so much spiritual warfare during the week because the, the enemy of our souls does not want that pastor to get up and preach the Word of God. And I can tell you that me teaching the Word of God, I always have to deal with a lot of spiritual warfare and battles uh, when it comes to teaching the Word of God and, and, trying, and trying to bless with the Word of God my brothers and sisters. So pray for those who deliver the word to you. That's scriptural, and, and we should be doing that. So, and I would say even uh, music ministers uh, that get up and, they're, and a good godly music minister is praying over the music he needs to be leading at church because that, that initially gets people's minds when you're singing and praising to the Lord before the word is ever actually preached, you are uh, a music minister is helping people to detach from the world that they just left to walk into these doors and helping them to focus on worshiping and praising the Lord. And when you go into a church a congregation where you're seated around bro fellow brothers and sisters there is nothing better than forgetting everything else and just concentrating on the words of some good godly uh, anointed songs lifting up your voice and if you're like me I can't sing a lick I can't I don't know what what rhythm is I, I have no concept of any of that but I lift up my voice and I'm singing not to my wife not to my brothers and sisters I, I'm singing to the Lord and I know that it's pleasing to his ears it doesn't have to be pleasing to anybody else that I'm around and it's probably not but I'm singing to, to praise the Lord and I'll lift my hands up and I'll thank the Lord and I'll praise him and just want to uh, thank him for everything that he's done for me and I don't care who who's around me and, and who doesn't like me lifting my hands and praising and all that. Uh, I try to do, I do everything decently and in order, but I'm going to praise my Lord, and I'm not going to have anyone tell me different. I'm not going to have anyone tell me, hey, look, you can't be speaking in church. You can't be raising your hands in church. Well, then it's time to leave that that place. But uh, what is your gift? What is your gift? Think about that. I challenge you to pray about that and if you need to fast uh, you know a couple of meals a day or whatever it may be seek the Lord on what your gift is and what the Lord would have you to do 
so that you can be in his perfect will. Hopefully that makes sense. It's very, very important. All right, verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime. And I know I can say amen to that. I have wasted so many years of my, my youth following after the, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the things of this world. I, I wish I could get some of that time back. I wish I knew then what I know now. Oh, how I would serve God in my youth. In doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in the lewdness and lusts, drunkenness, revivories, drinking parties, what a waste of time, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of disposition. This uh, disposition speaking evil of you. So the world, if you're not doing the things that they do, which is anti-God, they're going to speak evil of you. You just better mark that down. And then here's the big thing, my brothers and sisters, and for you new Christians, if any of you are watching this, um, if you are new in the faith, you're going to have to make a stand. You're going to have to draw a line in the sand. And you're going to have to say, I am a child of God. And I am going to stay on this side of the fence. I am not going to straddle the fence and live half in the world and half in the kingdom of God. You can't do that. I know that there's a lot of people that are confessing Christians that try to straddle the fence and you, you can do that for a very short time, but I promise you that the world will win over and pull you over into it if, you're, if you dabble in what I call Egypt for a little bit of time, you're going to go back to Egypt. So you better be careful because uh, that, that serpent, the world, is going to bite you and it's, it's going to be painful. So you've got to make up your mind, you've got to determine I'm going to stand here and be steadfast in Christ. I'm going to learn everything I can about this book. I'm going to spend time studying it and reading it and praying over it and, and asking God to help me and open up my mind to my comprehension levels. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit gives me godly discernment so I can know what's really of God and what's not of God. And I just want to grow and I want to leave milk behind and I want to start chewing some meat the meat of the word and become a faithful disciple of Christ hallelujah that's what's important verse 5 they will give an account to him that's speaking of Jesus who is ready to judge the living and the dead now you have to remember that God the Father turned all judgment and when I say all judgment, this refers to all Christians who have lived and died, all of those of us that are alive now that will be caught up when the trumpet sounds, when the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture takes place, we will be caught up together uh, with the dead and meet Christ in the air. And then we go back to heaven where we will spend seven years with the Lord it'll be during that time we will stand at the bema seat judgment where we where we will be judged individually for the things that we did here on the earth and it won't be a time of judgment where we are um cast into hell we, we're, we made it we're, we're saved we're going to be with christ forever but I think the biggest thing is, when we stand at that judgment, we are going to be face to face with all of the things that we should have done for Christ that we didn't do. And that, I believe, is going to cause us to weep, and we're going to have sadness at that particular moment, but the Bible's crystal clear. Jesus is going to welcome us in to the kingdom of God and he's going to wipe away all those tears 
And ultimately, he will tell us, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And then we will go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we will return with Christ at the second coming, where he defeats Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet. And then we will rule and reign with him. Hallelujah. For a thousand years, this is known as the millennial reign in the Bible. And you can find this throughout Scripture. Uh, the Old Testament is full of it with the prophets. You can find it in Zechariah, the last chapter. You can find it in uh, the book of Isaiah from chapter 60 through 66, plus an additional many other chapters in Isaiah. You find it in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, uh, every, single, every single prophet, uh, I think, pretty much touches on the millennial reign except maybe one or two off the top of my head so there's a great future that lies in store for us but it is not this world this world is only a occupying dwelling place for us it's temporal it's temporary and while we're here we need to work for Christ we need to win souls we need to support missionaries we need to support our local church if we're going to a good church we have a godly pastor that preaches the word of God we need to financially support that and we need to financially support missionaries so that they can win people over uh, to the Lord in other other nations very very important and we need to be giving and loving one another and supporting one another very very important but Jesus has been given all judgment and he will judge every single lost person that's ever died from the time of uh, Adam and Eve all the way up to the to the last uh, battle the Battle of Armageddon he's going to judge all of those people and then through the millennial reign there will be people that also will have every opportunity to accept him as Lord and they refuse to do it so all those people that go through the millennial reign, at the end of the millennial reign, all these people are going to be resurrected, and they are going to be judged for the things that they have done. And ultimately, when the books are opened, these are going to be the books of remembrance, and you find that throughout Scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament. God is keeping a record of everything we say, we think, and that we do. And for these lost people, unfortunately, their record is not going to be good. And then ultimately, the book of life will be opened. The Lamb's book of life. This is everyone that's in that book has received Christ as their Lord and Savior. They have been what the Bible talks about being born again their name goes in that book and at the great white throne judgment seat of Christ that's what this is referring to and he's ready to, to, to judge both the living and the dead so the living are all of us that will that will stand before Christ at a different judgment and then all those that will stand uh, before Christ at the great white throne judgment and unfortunately all those people at that judgment their their eternal destiny is eternal death in the lake of fire that was originally prepared for the devil and all the fallen angels never was that prepared for man the Bible is crystal clear it is not God's will that any should perish but that everyone would repent and come to life in Christ and that's that's what scripture teaches hallelujah verse 6 for this reason the gospel was preached also to those who were dead uh, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to God in the spirit now this is not talking about that God went and, and preached to people in hell that's not what this is talking about uh, again it's not God's will that any should perish but that all should come to everlasting life so the gospel was preached to everyone that's, that's ever lived 
Uh, even back in Noah's day, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and we kind of went over that in the last chapter. Uh, they had every opportunity to ask Noah, uh, why was he building an ark? So through Noah preaching that judgment was coming, God commanded him to build the ark, uh, he was preaching repentance. And repentance points to Christ. That And all repentance points to, to, to Christ. And that's what this is talking about, that these people, they heard the gospel, uh, they repented, and uh, during their time on this earth, they, they died and they were buried. Uh, their spirit and their soul went to be with the Lord, uh, but their body of flesh remains in the ground. Now, it's decayed. There's probably nothing uh, left. But God's promise is that he's going to resurrect that body. When the pre-tribulation rapture happens, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians that the dead in Christ, that's what these people are, will be raised first. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them in the, with to meet them and to meet the Lord in the air. And they will be resur- their body will be resurrected. They will receive a glorified body just as we will. Uh, and they will no longer be spirit and soul, but they will be combined with their body, just like we are now. We're flesh, spirit, and soul. That's what will happen to them. But the only difference is that this body of flesh that is decaying, you can, you can see it by my hair falling out, turning gray, uh, wrinkles under my eyes, bags under my eyes, my skin is, is just getting old, all of this will stop because we will have a body like Christ when he was resurrected from the dead. And the purpose of that body is so that we can live eternally, never age, never be sick, never, our bodies never decay, but more importantly than that, that we can now stand, hallelujah, in the presence of Almighty God, uh, in all of his full Shekinah glory, and we not burn up and become uh, a stain on the floor. Uh, I, th- I believe that that's one of the reasons why we, we have to have a glorified body is so that we can stand in the presence of God. So, anyway, hallelujah. All right, verse 7. So Peter goes on, he says this, but the end of all things is at hand. Now you got to remember, this was 2,000 years ago. And all of the apostles... All of the New Testament writers believed that they were living in the the last moments of time because Christ was prophesied, you know, a long time before they were born. He came the first time and he told them he was coming back and he also told them that he was coming back and that where he where he is we, we will come with him and be with him also. That in his father's house there are many mansions or compartments and where he is, that's where we're going to be. And that's another uh, scripture uh, proof for the pre-tribulation rapture is John 14.1 uh, through verse 3. There's no way to get around that. Uh, why would we go to be with the Lord in these mansions if we're going to go through the tribulation period. It just doesn't make any sense. All right. So they believed that they were living in the last time. He goes on and says, Therefore, be serious. Listen to these words now. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. So Peter is is telling them, Look, we're living in the last days. You need to, and I'm going to paraphrase here, you need to knuckle down, be alert, Realize you're living in the last times. How much more now, 2,000 years after Peter wrote this, with everything that we see going on, everything that you see going on with Israel now, Israel is the center point of God's end time events. Jerusalem is ground zero. So when we see what's going on now, this is all building up for these end time wars. The Gog-Magog War, 
Psalm 83 war, all of these things now are start, everything that we see now is starting to make sense. Because Israel, what they're going to do, even if they get more hostages back, they are determined at this point, and I believe being pushed by God, to wipe out Hamas. And when they wipe them out, Hezbollah is really going to kick up. And this is going to infuriate Iran and all the other Arab countries that are around, that are anti-Israel to begin with. And I believe we're going to see a coalition of all of the northern armies, Russia, Turkey, all of these other countries are going to come against Israel because Israel is going to defy the UN resolutions. And with this current president we have today, uh, who is it was really, I believe, pro-Palestinian and pro-Arab, he is going to come against Israel at some point and turn his back, and that's going to be a, a serious blow for the United States when that happens. When America turns its back on Israel, uh, we're pretty much done. Uh, but I believe all of this is coming together now. We may not see all these pieces of the puzzle put together, but I believe all of it's being put together now. And it all makes sense. It's just escalating to, this, to the last of the last days. And keep your eyes on Israel, because that is going to be God's prophetic time clock. And it looks like everything is moving in the direction that all the Old Testament prophets prophesied thousands of years ago. This is what's going to happen in the last of the last days. And all I can say is hallelujah, because when God's done with these nations, when God's judgment on Israel is complete... Uh, sin will be done away with. Jesus will come back and rule and reign from Jerusalem in righteousness. And he is going to abolish sin and wickedness and ungodliness forever and ever. Hallelujah. So there's going to be some tough times that are coming, but a glorious time right behind it. So Peter is telling us to be serious, to be watchful in our prayers, and above all things, have a fragrant love one for another. Love will, cult, uh, will cover a multitude of sins. And here's what's so important, that we Christians, and you know, we're not going to agree on every single jot and tittle when it comes to the Word of God, and that's fine. As long as we believe on the fundamentals of the faith, that's, that's what keeps us bound together. We can, we can disagree on things. You know, if you disagree with me on the pre-tribulation rapture, that's fine. If you believe in the mid-trip, I disagree with you, but you're still my brother, and I'm still going to love you, uh, and I'm not going to mock you because you believe that. Um, but we, we must love one another, encourage one another, and try to be there for one another as much as we possibly can. Because who else can we go to? The world hates us. And we're seeing that ramp up as we get closer and closer to the sound of the trumpet. So it's very, very important that we stay together. The, the book of Hebrews tells us not to forsake the gathering, to, the assembling together of ourselves, even so when we see that day approaching. So as we approach that day, we need to have more and more fellowship with like-minded believers. And it's very, very important. And one of the things I've been uh, blessed with for the last year is doing a home Bible study with a, a shut-in and uh, some other um, godly uh, brother and uh, sister that are elderly. They're, about eight, they're all about 80 years old. And... Uh, I do a Bible study there on Saturdays about every three weeks. We do about a two-hour study, and we have just a great time. We have prayer. We have worship. We pray for one another. We pray for other people. We study the Word of God. And uh, with God's help, I do my very best to bring out as much out of the Scripture as I can so that it even feeds and blesses um, 
well-established Christians that have been living for God for uh, 60 years. And I feel so honored to be able to have that as a privilege. And it's a very small group. And we, you know, we may add a few more people here and there, but um, they can't get out as much to church. So church is being brought to them. So, and maybe that's your calling. Maybe, maybe there's some shut-ins where you live, and maybe you can go and, and minister to them and bless them. You know, uh, those people have ministered to other people for so many years, and when you get older, your body, you know, we talked about this, it, j it just doesn't function as well. Can't move around as much. So someone's got to go and be a blessing to uh, our shut-ins. So, and what a great ministry. And, you know, they, they may receive a lot out of it, but, but trust me, <laughs> you that does the ministering to them, you will receive so much more <laughs> than they will because uh, you're being used of the Lord, and uh, it's just such a blessing and an honor to be able to do that. All right. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will, cult, uh, will cover a multitude of sins. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift. Here we go. What is your gift? Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Hallelujah. So my, my brothers and my sisters, what is your gift? Seek the Lord for that gift and use it. Don't, don't wait until it's too late, and then you have no opportunity to use that gift. You know, whether it's, it's let's, say, let's just say you're going to a church, and uh, someone gets up and does announcements, and they say, hey, we need some, some, some people to work in the church. We need people to hand out the programs to be greeters, ushers, um, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, it's a privilege. It's an honor to be able to serve the Lord. Not everyone's called to be a pastor, and that's that's a that is a call of God to be a pastor, to be a shepherd. It's a call of God to teach the Word of God because you've got to dive in. You got to spend a lot of time studying and preparing to be able to feed the flock. It's a it's a heavy call to be an evangelist. To be able to have souls uh, at at your uh, hearing of your word, and 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 you're going to be held accountable for what you preach to those individuals. Either you lead them to Christ, or you lead them in the wrong direction. <clears throat> so th those are heavy calls, but not everyone is called to do those things. And there's so much more. And I can tell you, over the years, I've heard so many pastors talk about brother and sister so-and-so that worked in the church and they did this and they did that and what a blessing it was for a pastor to have people so committed to work in a local congregation uh, and it's very important that we do that and maybe you have a, a ministry like what you see me doing here maybe your call is is to teach and to preach the word and you're doing it uh, with videos and putting them on YouTube where they go all over the world um, I've had people reach out to me in Australia and uh, uh, the United Kingdom that, that watch these videos and in Africa and comment on it. And you talk about a humbling moment when people reach out from another nation and that are blessed by the Word of God, something that the Holy Spirit allowed me to say or prompted me to say that ministers somebody, oh, wow. What a blessing. What a absolute blessing. So I, I say again, find out what your gift is, seek the Lord, and, and be used of him. All right, verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Uh, and this is the word of God. Speak about the things of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Hallelujah! That in all things God may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. 
So as we, if we are going to minister the word, let us do it as God gives you the ability and find that, that gift and that ability that God's given you to, uh, to, to teach and to preach the word of God and whatever it may be. Verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning, concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed you may also be glad with exceeding joy so friends here it is as a child of God, as a Christian, you're going to go through trials, you're going to go through tribulations, you're going to be persecuted. Don't think it's strange or weird. This is normal. And I can tell you that every time you go through a trial, you go through tribulation, you should be drawn closer to the Lord, and then God is going to use those things to bring you out at the end of that, where you're going to be better than you were before you went into it for his glory for his purposes and God is going to do a marvelous thing if you allow him to do it and I, I can testify personally to that and I, I believe most Christians that are watching this can also say that now it's not easy to go through those things but when you do uh, it's time to really just call out to the Lord and sometimes God is just wants us to spend more time calling out to him and sometimes he has to do things to get our attention so look at look at it as a teaching as a training opportunity through every trial through every tribulation and every persecution God is going to mold me and shape me into the person he wants me to be not the person I want to be but the person he wants me to be and if we have that and we're humble about it, God is going to do something miraculous and beautiful. Hallelujah. Verse 14. If you, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, hallelujah, blessed are you. So when you are persecuted for the name of Christ, if someone says something to you, are you one of those fanatical Christians? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hallelujah. Thank God I am. Praise God. Bible says you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Wow. Look, look at what scripture says. When you're being persecuted, if you're living right, and you're doing the right things, and you're holding up, and you're quoting scripture, and you're, you're living for God and trying to win people to Christ, and you're persecuted for it, then you are blessed. And... God's Spirit rests upon you. And you know what? As you're being persecuted and people are saying all kinds of bad things about you, you need to look them in the eye and be praying under your breath, Holy Spirit, give me something that I can say to this person that, that will bring conviction, will cause them to want to repent, and cause them to turn from their wicked ways. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We should not be thinking, oh, I'd like to bash that person upside the head. That is not Christ-like. That is not anything we should be doing. But we need to be praying for that person. You know why? Because at some point in our life, we were that person. We were that person. At least I know I was at, at some point in my life. And I thank the Lord that he has saved me and redeemed me and changed my life forever. Verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers, here we go, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. The apostles glorified God when they were beaten and put in prison, and they suffered for the name of Christ. 
Peter died a martyr's death and he was crucified like Christ but he felt number one it was a privilege to be crucified to, to, to die a martyr's death but number two he did not want to be crucified in the same exact way that Christ was he didn't feel worthy so he asked them to turn him upside down and he was crucified not up like Christ but he was turned upside down and crucified that way wow what power what strength what convictions uh, what trust in God and God's plans and because of their deaths and many other Christians deaths many other people came to Christ to God be the glory and to God the victory hallelujah verse 17 for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God and it begins with us first that we be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God so we need to be judged first to make sure we're right with God before judgment comes to anyone else verse 18 now if the righteous one is scarcely saved where will the ungodly and the sinner appear we need to be praying for for lost people verse 19 therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator now my brothers and sisters if we want to be in God's perfect will we got to trust God that he's got everything in, in control he's the creator of the universe and no matter what comes our way uh, let's remain faithful and be steadfast in Christ keep your eyes on him no matter no matter what comes friends and if it seems overbearing reach out to your brothers and sisters have them pray for you and there's no, there's no shame in that we just read where we are to encourage one another and to love one another and sometimes uh, we have you know it may seem overbearing to us and that we can't get through it but we can with God's help and with our brothers and sisters praying for us and uh, this is to all my brothers and sisters if you have a, a child of God asking you to pray and they're going through a very difficult time shame on you if you don't spend the time praying for them and encouraging them and lifting them up we are called to do that so until next time folks uh, remain steadfast keep your eyes on jesus love your brothers and sisters pray for them and let's win some people before the rapture takes place god bless you until next time